Okay, good afternoon. Uh, people are still doing the test stuff, so I won't say too much about it. But what I will say is that so far, uh, the multiple choice, multiple answer is looking better than the first one, which is good to see. And the survey results are also looking better so far. So if you've done it, of course, fill out the test due survey, just so I know um, how you're feeling about it uh, at the moment. And then we can make further adjustments for test three. Seems like the short answer was a little bit harder than test one. Uh, and the multiple choice was um, better for time. Uh, from my side, the time looks a lot better. So in the first test for multiple choice and short answer, the average time to complete was very close to the limit. While on this one, the average time is about 12 minutes less than the limit. So uh, the time pressure is not a huge deal anymore, which uh, for, for most people, of course, there's still people with time pressure, but for most people, there's not a big time pressure um, compared to the first, which is good to see. Okay, so I won't talk too much about it because people are still uh, doing it, expect an announcement when grades are released. Um, I'll be releasing the multiple choice and short answer grades at the same time like last time, just because they do go together. Uh, and that way you're not seeing one and then getting anxious about the second part to see if that lowers or raises your grade. Okay, so we're going into the third unit of the course now, which is the most uh, applicable to real life. So in the first unit, it's more like the theoretical components of language, like what is language? What is communication? Uh, do animals have language? The second component is more about the brain and language development. So how do we acquire it? What are some problems with it? How does the brain interpret it? And now we're going into language use and technology. So today for about 50 minutes, and next week, we're going to talk about sociolinguistics, which is about language and society. So how language differs depending on gender, class, uh, the languages you speak, and so on. Uh, two weeks after this, we're going to talk about computational linguistics. So how language and technology is used. We're going to have a guest speaker, someone who graduated from SFU, uh, from the Linguistics and Computing Science Department, who has a job doing computational linguistics now. Uh, they make quite a bit of money. So the last hour of the class on the 21st will be a brief introduction to what they do at their job. Um, a little bit of actual computational linguistics content too, uh, but mostly like how they got into their work, what they do, and some Q&A. Uh, and then in the last week, we'll do some forensic linguistics, which is still like computational linguistics. It's more about the technology that we can use to uh, look at things like plagiarism, ransom notes, uh, ransom calls, how we can identify who's speaking on the other end and things like that. So more applications of language than so far that we've done in the course. So you'll also notice that the types of questions that you're getting are a little bit more uh, definitional, more like, a little bit less applied than what we've done so far, just because of the nature of the content. So uh, sociolinguistics is all about society and language. And specifically, we're looking at this thing called variationist sociolinguistics. So this is about taking a look within a society and looking for variations between people. So. This could be variations dependent on say gender or age or power or economic class. So how do rich people talk differently from poor people or how do uh, women talk differently from men? That was a big thing that was studied 40, 50 years ago that right now isn't really that important to us because uh, a lot of it is now similar because of the internet and a lot of um, social movements, of course. There's been a lot of standardized speech. So uh, we'll take a look at how language is used in society. That's a very broad term. Um, but specifically, we'll be looking at some of the social factors that affects our use of language and how these differ from language to language. 
So there are differences in English compared to like Italian and French. So first some terms. Uh, when we speak, we give a lot of information about ourselves uh, based on the way that we pronounce words, based on the words that we choose to use, even based on the sentence structures that we use. Uh, for instance, if I say something like, oh, I never, or, um, oh, hun, would you please be a deer and pick that up for me? Uh, when you hear me say those things, you probably don't expect, yeah, that's a 28-year-old male. That, that doesn't sound like a 28-year-old male. That sounds like uh, someone older. So uh, when you speak, you have these things called markers. And these markers are variables that other people notice, and they give information about you away. So some sort of social meaning, whether it's like uh, class, whether it's gender, whether it's age, um, whether it's some power difference, there are markers that give it away. So this is a historical fact here, where if you would say a word like swimming, swimming. So swimming has that ing at the end. And there's two ways people pronounce this, uh, swimming and swimming. And it used to be the case that if you say swimming, you're lower class, while if you're swimming, you're higher class. So based on how you perceive someone uh, say that, yeah, based on how you perceive someone pronounce that word, you could tell what class they were in just by the pronunciation. Yeah, or British. That, that, that could be a giveaway too. Uh, but if we're talking about like within, say, uh, North America, for example, like 100 years ago, that could be a giveaway. Uh, this, this happened in uh, Wheel of Fortune, like less than 10 years ago. This was a big deal. Someone answered uh, one of the prompts in a game show as seven swans a swimming and they couldn't give her the prize money because she didn't say seven swans a swimming because it wasn't the proper dialect and proper pronunciation which is absurd because she knew the word and she said the word and that's really all that should matter but this is an example of a marker it gives away information about you uh, there are these other things called indicators and these are things that just don't give information away and people are just unaware of these. So these might be little quirks that you have as an individual that don't signal anything about gender or age. This is just a you thing. So like saying we used to always go rather than we would always go. If you're someone who says used to or would, this is just a personal preference. This doesn't say that you're uh, an old man or an old lady. It just says, like, that's your choice. So um, a marker is something that says, hey, like, I'm marking this person as being old or young or rich or poor. An indicator is something that says, well, maybe, maybe they're older, but, like, this is probably just an individual person thing. There's not really any association with this. So I don't really know why the term indicator is used, but uh, that's the term that's used. Okay. Well, so we've kind of covered the first point, but um, as you may know, and you probably have had prejudices or um, thoughts about this. When you hear certain accents or you hear other people talk, you have beliefs, you make assumptions about those people. Like when you hear a Texan talk and you hear this like uh, redneck cowboy speech, uh, you make assumptions about the person. And uh, unfortunately, I mean, this is something that just happens, but uh, this is not something about the language. Like the way that someone's accent is, is not a fact about language itself. So if someone has this uh, Texan drawl, it's not that that drawl means like, oh, a person's stupid. It's just a social norm. It's just an attitude. It's something that's been developed, a stereotype. 
So the, the ideas and beliefs that we associate with certain accents um, is just something that has developed over time from society. It's, it's not an actual fact of language. Like when you hear a British person talk and you think, oh, they sound smart or intelligent. Uh, that's just a social norm rather than an actual fact that British people are smart. Uh, this also works in reverse too, in sort of an interesting way, because if you want to sound smart, you might also put on a fake accent. You might try to talk like a British person because you believe that if you speak like a British person, you will be smarter. So you might actually change the way you speak in order to identify or change your own belief or attitude. So it does work both ways. Um, of course, typically you would change yourself to be a higher status um, while other people are gonna make judgments about you for being a lower status. So uh, here's an old study, and this was in the 1960s. So uh, let's just keep this in mind if you're thinking, like, what are these stores that we're about to talk about? Um, so this was a question, like, how do people treat others of different classes? So we're going to talk about economic class now. Uh, if you're a rich person, a poor person, or somewhere in the middle class. And the idea is, okay, so there's three different department stores. Um, there's Saks, there's Macy's, and there's Klein's. So the idea is that Saks is like this high-class store where high-class people shop. Macy's is this mid-class store where mid-class people shop. And Klein's is a low-class store where low-class people shop. Okay. So there's different classes of people that shop at different places. And uh, it used to be the case that you have this R sound. And if you pronounce the R sound in words like fourth and floor, you're more high class, while the lower class people do not pronounce the R. So a low class would be something like fourth floor, while high class would be like fourth floor. So fourth floor versus fourth floor. So you can hear the R versus no R. Now, instead of observing how people say it in the wild, they looked at employees who worked at these stores because the employees know the type of people that come in. So they're, you know, used to talking to a certain class of people. And it's a lot easier to elicit certain words out of those employees because you can say, well, um, you can go up to an employee and say, where is the store located? And you can get the employee to say, oh, they're on the fourth floor. So a very famous sociolinguist, William LeBov, uh, he is essentially the, the daddy of sociolinguistics. That's how you can put it. That's really just the best way to put it. Uh, every study that's ever been done, it feels like he's been part of it. Um, he talked to different employees at these stores to see how they pronounced the R, if they pronounced the R. And he found that the higher the class the store, so at Saks, they pronounced the R more often because they were talking to higher class people. So they would say fourth floor. If you go to Klein's, it wasn't pronounced. They would just say fourth floor because they were talking to lower class people. But what's interesting is that when he said, sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, then the employees would repeat the word, but they would put the R in there. So even when you're at Klein's and you said, oh, fourth floor. Oh, sorry, can you repeat that? They'd say, oh, fourth floor. They'd enunciate. They would make this assumption that, oh, hold on, I should be speaking a little bit more formally the second time. So uh, this study was really just to verify something. It was to verify that there's a difference between speech when it comes to low class and high class people, and that there's this prestigious speech used for the high class. So this is a very early study that basically confirmed that, yeah, this R sound is prestigious. This is a sound that prestigious people use in their dialect. So like if you're at a mid-class store, the idea is like sometimes it's pronounced. I mean, it's difficult to say, right? Like it's not that the employees are randomly choosing whether it's fourth or fourth. It's, it's more just so 
the employees have a preference and they'll stick with it. So uh, this isn't like a causation, this is just a correlation thing. So the higher the prestige, the more likely you are to pronounce R. Okay, so when I hear stuff like this, and I hear lower class does not pronounce R and higher class pronounces R, uh, I always think of friends out there, the people in the movies who are like second best or who are lower on the totem pole and, and they want to sound better. So usually you have a friend or you know someone who just tries to sound like they're at a higher class than they are, sound like someone that they're not. And what ends up happening is they use these patterns way more often than they should. And it just sounds unnatural. And this is something called hypercorrection. So when you try to use a prestigious form more often than is natural. So if we were to divide uh, high class, or middle class, lower class in, into, separate, into separate categories, like on a scale. So let's say nine is the highest, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. So it's sort of done in this graph, but I'll just draw it out here. So this is six to eight, five to four, two to three. Um, what ends up happening is if you're in the second best category, so in this six to eight range of being lower middle class, you try to sound more prestigious than you actually are. So uh, this class, I need to make this a little bit bigger. The lower middle class uses the R pronunciation more often than the higher uh, middle class, so the nines. So they want to sound more prestigious, so they end up hypercorrecting themselves, using it more often than where it's natural. But this doesn't just happen everywhere, because it's very difficult to consciously do this all the time. So it happens in very specific circumstances. So if we take a look at the graph here, um, it's a little convoluted, but where we're really focusing on is that little circle and at the very bottom here, where we're taking a look at casual speech, careful speech, reading style, wordless and minimal pairs. So the bottom of this graph looks at different styles of speech. So casual speech is when you're just talking uh, with people you know. Careful speech is when you're conscious of what you're saying. Um, you're talking in a, in a formal environment where it matters what you say. Uh, reading style, this is when you're reading something from, say, a book. A word list is when you're given just a list of words to read. And minimal pairs, this is like when you're uh, contrasting two words. So uh, A, B, C, and D are generally self-explanatory, but e, uh, e might not have come across these terms, or at least it's been a while since we have. Okay, so as soon as you get to the tasks where you have more time to focus, like reading style and word lists, and you can be conscious of how you speak, this is where you start hypercorrecting. So this is where we see this lower middle class producing way more R sounds than the higher middle class. So these are the two lines. The, the green line there is the higher middle class or the upper middle class, and the red line there is the lower middle class. So as soon as you can focus more on what you're saying, then you start hypercorrecting because you want to sound more prestigious than you actually are. And uh, the, the, the axis here that we're looking at is like what 
percentage of words you're saying that have R's, the R is actually pronounced. So, I mean, even if you are upper class, you're still only pronouncing the R's like uh, not all the time. It's just most of the time. So, I mean, we'll talk about this a little bit in forensic linguistics too, um, but this isn't just something that happens with like uh, economic class, but when people go and disguise themselves as others to imitate others in order to catch predators or whatever, uh, this is also something that happens and people are really good at picking up on it. So if you wanna be uh, a good imitator, you have to be aware of hypercorrection and make sure that you're not doing it, which is tough. Okay, so is there such a thing as hypo or undercorrection? Um, it's not often that people undercorrect themselves. That's not usually something that happens. I mean, well, I mean, with even with undercorrection, we would still say that you're trying to achieve that specific uh, target. So like, let's say you want, well, I mean, even then you're making a judgment about a lower class, which is something that we don't really do now in sociolinguistics. Uh, to talk about economic class as a dialect is something that's more done historically than it is in the modern day. Uh, typically the only hyper correction that we see is with something like British royalty or royalty in general, uh, at least in, English speaking societies. So we don't really see under correction. At least that's not a term that I've seen studied. Yeah, I mean, like a hyper correction really just means to to overcorrect to use it more often than it should be so hyper just means over like to overcorrect so like in using aab aabe slang if you use more slang than what is natural you're hypercorrecting because you're using it more often than you should be Yeah, sorry, I was thinking in, in prestige, but hyper hyper just means to over and hypo would mean to under. So over correcting versus under correcting. Okay, so I mean, like what we find with these findings is that, you know, there are different variants that are related to prestige. And what we find is that actually these higher prestiges often take uh, these, these, um, speech patterns from other societies. So North Americans, like prestigious speech often sounds very British. Now, uh, this is often a remnant of history too, because a hundred years ago, it wasn't easy to travel. It wasn't easy to know what British people sounded like. Well, maybe 150 years ago, maybe not a hundred years ago. Before it was easy to fly, before television was something that you could get access to. With the internet now, it's different. I mean, we can hear what people sound like, we can experience what, they, uh, what their lives are like. Um, so that's why something foreign was a lot more prestigious back then. So that's why when we hear foreign accents, we still think it's a little bit prestigious because that's what we've been ingrained to think. Um, and higher class people tend to use more prestige variants. I mean, this is, this is normal. When you're high class, you wanna sound like you're high class. This is something that we've been ingrained to, to feel in society. This is something that they've been taught. Uh, so that's what they'll do. Oh, this point. There's a strong relationship between class and careful speech styles. So uh, careful speech styles, again, I didn't type this out, but I'll type this. Um, this is when you are 
uh, talking, well, talking more carefully is really the way I can describe it best, um, but uh, talking slower, more formally, um, you know, choosing your words consciously, uh, people you don't know, etc. So if you're a higher class, you're going to be much more careful with the words that you choose. If you're a lower class, I mean, cor uh, correlating here, if you're a lower class, typically you don't care too much about choosing your words correctly or making sure that you're being appropriate in speech. Again, correlation, not causation. These are just general trends. These aren't absolute um, certainties about who you are as a person and what you're going to do. Okay, so this was a nice little intro to sociolinguistics here. Um, I'm, I'm trying to break these up now into different parts just because this sociolinguistics lecture, um, it does feel a little bit jumpier than the other ones because there's a lot of different uh, subtopics in sociolinguistics. So one of the big things is forms of address, how we address other people. And if we just live in an English speaking world, there's nothing, really to talk about here because we just address people the same way for the most part uh, we really have to look to other languages to get the most out of it so uh, i mean in english we can still do a little bit of this so if we would start an email or a text to a friend or a parent or a professor or a doctor or 70 year old aunt i mean like how, how do we start emails to these people i mean like I don't know, I feel like dated. Yo, what up my dude? I don't know. Uh, parents usually just say hi. A sibling, I don't have siblings. It'd be weird if I talked to one. A professor, I don't know. It's been a while since I've emailed a professor, but usually it's like, hello or dear doctor, XXX, you know, put a comma. You, know, you put a dear sometimes. It depends on the formality of what you're doing. If you're making a request, a formal request, you use dear. If it's not a formal request, I use hello. Depends. If it's a doctor, uh, he's not going to talk to me anyway. So I don't, I'm not going to email him. Um, he'll get back to me in two to four business weeks. Member of parliament, not going to talk to them. But I mean, like, depending on who you talk to, it's going to be a little bit different. If I'm texting my 70 year old aunt, I'm going to talk in all capital letters because uh, that's all they know how to do on Facebook. 25 year old uncle. We're not, we're not that young, are we? Friends, parents, oh, what are friends? Okay, let's move on. But anyway, it's, it's different. So let's just move away from English and talk about a system that's a little bit more interesting. So, I mean, in English, the best we can do normally for formality is use terms like uh, uh, sir or ma'am or doctor. But in Japanese and some other languages, they have these terms like honorifics. So honorifics are little markers that attach to people, to people's names. And they signal some term of respect or some term of status a relationship between you and the person. So depending on your relationship with that person depends on which marker you use. And typically you have to use a marker unless you know someone really well, in which case you can drop it. I mean, in Japanese, for example, even using someone's first name is a sign of closeness. You would use their last name until you're really close to that person. So in Japanese, for example, uh, you can say their name with Chan after. Um, you'd find them cute because they're a baby or they're a significant other. Or if you're, you know, some macho dude and you're trying to like emasculate them, then you could use it. Uh, if you're just trying to 
talk to like a regular person, you would just use son. So that's like uh, anyone you talk to who's around the same status or same age as you. Uh, if someone is a senior in your place, you'd call them a senpai. Uh, if someone is teaching you, you'd use the term sensei. Uh, if you're talking to someone at a super high formal level, you'd call them sama. And you put their names before this, their last name before this, but depending on their rank and how close you are, so from low to high, low at the top, high at the bottom, you'd use a different honorific. So that's how you can address other people in Japanese, and we don't have this in English. So if you learn Japanese, for example, uh, you have to be very careful that you understand the system, because if you don't use the system, uh, your, your foreigner pass can only get you so far before you are offensive. I mean, of course, they'll see like, oh, you're a foreigner, you can get away with it. But, um, you know, depending on the situation you're in, you do have to understand it eventually. Yeah, no waifu category. That's, that's Chan. That's Chan. Yeah, Sama is not used in daily life. So it's, it's, it is like incredibly formal. It's archaic. It's, it's sort of like, mas like master or like, yeah, God, as just said, Kami Sama, which is God. Um, it's, it's weird, uh, but isn't it interesting that lowest categories is assigned to feminine people most of the time? Yeah. So that's also something we'll talk about next week when we think about uh, language and gender, but, um, that's a pattern we also find across the world in different languages. In some, in some languages that's, uh, disappearing in other languages, it's still strong because, um, although society doesn't determine what the language is, there is a correlation between how society acts and what the language is like. So, I mean, in English, we don't really have anything like this. So uh, here's a term. So the person you're talking to is called uh, the interlocutor, the interlocutor. Uh, if you say interlocutor, that's fine too. But interlocutor is the person you're talking to. So in English, it doesn't matter if it's a professor or a doctor, a friend, a pet snail. Uh, you can just use the word you. So, dear Dr. Hyped, how are you? Or, hey, Gary, how are you? Doesn't matter if it's a professor or a snail. You can use the word you. But uh, in many of the Romance languages and some Germanic languages, there is formal pronoun and an informal pronoun. So uh, French is one example of a language we'll look at. And the formal pronouns usually have what's called the V form and the informal have what's called the T form. So if you've studied French, um, you know, Fu and you know, too. So let's take a look at how these pronouns evolved. Uh, but before that, let's just give a general summary of them. So here's just how they work, and then we'll talk about the history of them and uh, how, how their meanings, well, not their meanings have changed, but the purpose of these pronouns have changed over time. So here's some examples of languages on the right. So Latin, French, German, Italian, and Spanish. You notice Latin had these as well, and English came from Latin. So um, it's surprising that English doesn't have a, a little bit of these since we've got so much from Latin, but um, I mean, German too. Latin and German both had them, but English doesn't. It's interesting that we've gotten rid of them. So the T form, uh, this is the informal form is used uh, reciprocally among family and close friends. So reciprocally just means back and forth among each other. Uh, the V form is used back and forth among people of equal status who are not close. So uh, you could think of T form now as being closeness. So if, if you're close with people, you'll use it. Uh, v form is for people who are not close but equal. But when you have a status imbalance, 
So when you have, say, a power difference, uh, so lower versus higher, this is when you have a difference in pronoun use. So when the lower talks to the higher, they would use the V form. But when the higher talks to the lower, they would use the T form. So when someone of low status talks to high status, they have to be formal. While when someone higher talks to someone lower, they can be informal. So um, even if they don't know each other, basically the higher status person doesn't have to give respect. You only give respect to people you don't know who are of the same status as you. So this is generally how it's used today in these languages. And this is sort of a mix between closeness and uh, power or status. But originally, it was entirely based on power. Um, there was nothing about closeness. Well, I mean, a little bit about closeness, but primarily about power. So if you had power, you used the T form on the people you had power over. So I have a couple examples here. So um, very much in terms of like say medieval times. So the king would use the informal form to his subjects and the subjects would use the formal version to the king. So um, high power is at the top here and low power is down here. So same uh, relation between parents and kids. Parents use T form to the kids and kids use V form to the parents. Um, if you had two people of equal power, you could choose T or V, but T or V was chosen depending on your social class. So it wasn't necessarily about closeness, it was about social class. So if you were kids or patients or serfs, well, this is really more about um, social class being money or economic. So it didn't really matter about the relationship of being parents or whatever. If you were low social status, you use the T form. If you were high class, you use the V form. So a little bit different than modern use. So even if you were, say, two parents that didn't really know each other well, you have equal status, uh, if you're low class, you still use the T form because you're low class. Um, while today, you don't know each other, but you're the same status, so you use the V form. So olden time, you're low class, so you use T, but now you're the same class, so you use V. Is that what you use or what you're referred to by? Um, uh, it's sort of both. So when you, t so, okay, so um, if it's like parent, parent in low class, they're both using T for each other. Uh, if it's like uh, doctor and doctor, and these are high class, they're both using V for each other. Um, if the doctor is talking to the parent, then the doctor is going to use T to the parent, and the parent is going to use uh, V for the doctor, because the parent is talking to someone higher than them. Okay. So originally, based on power. Um, over time, that changed. So it became more about closeness. And the formal term for closeness is called solidarity. So how close you are to someone is, how, is called solidarity. 
So if you shared some sort of commonality with someone, like uh, you both live in the same community, or uh, you both attend the same school, or uh, you both have the same job, um, or maybe you know you you went on the same trip or same journey, um, then you share something in common with those people. So as soon as you're in the same group, so no matter what the status of those people are, uh, you could have someone, uh, whether it's high status people and low status people, as soon as there's common ground with all those people, then you can use the T form with each other. So it became uh, the usage of the pronouns became about closeness. So you, you could break that power bond just by being close with someone, and then you could use the T form. So when we say solidary relations are symmetrical, this just means that if you can use the T form with one person, they can use the T form back. So it's like, um, it's, it's reciprocal, basically the same thing. Okay, so um, here's just an example. To, to sort of illustrate this process. So on the left of this bar, we have an intimate relationship. So by intimate, we mean there is high solidarity. So you're close, you're intimate, and there's a low social distance. So these are just uh, two ways of basically saying the same thing. So this could be like a brother or a friend. And this is an example of say how you could talk to someone. So if you say like, hey, dum dum, Hey, dumbass, like, this is how you talk to someone that you have closeness with or high solidarity with. While if you talk to like a stranger or a doctor, you have low solidarity. So you're not close with them. This means that there is a high social distance. And you're probably not going to say, hey, dum dum, unless you're feeling very confident or you have a much higher power over them. You're probably going to say something like, uh, excuse me, sir. You might even use, well, you might use sir. Sir is, is a little, I don't know. It's a little weird sometimes. You might just say, excuse me. You might be polite. So this doesn't necessarily illustrate the pronoun usage, but this does illustrate the concept of solidarity and social distance. So you can imagine other types of uh, people or uh, people in your life that you'd put on the scale here. So, um, of course, this is a continuous scale. So, um, as you become more familiar with people, there's someone, there's places in the middle. Like, for instance, um, you know, like this is, these like professors you've never talked to are somewhere over here, while, you know, professors you've talked to are somewhere in the middle, or maybe more along this line. Because you can feel like, you know, you've talked to them a little bit more. You can change your language a little bit. You can change how you can approach them a little bit. So, you know, as you get to know someone a little bit better or you talk to them more, um, you know, they, they can slide down the scale. And as you uh, fall apart a friendship or something, you know, people might move the other way down the scale as well. Like if you have a girlfriend and you break up with them that intimate goes to distant very fast. So now these pronouns are mostly uh, used with solidarity. So power usage isn't really a thing. So the difference between like an employee and an employer or a waiter and a customer. So an employer and employee, uh, there is a power relationship there, but the pronoun usage is more about closeness. If they like each other and they're close, they use T. If they, if they, don't, if they aren't close and they don't like each other or they're like a new employee, they use V. Uh, for waiter and customer, 
Yeah. If you're a waiter and a customer, you expect the waiter to be polite to you. You expect the servers to be polite. So they'll use the polite form. And as a customer, you should be polite to the server as well. So you use the V form as well. Okay. Um, and the change, the change is important here. So why does this change occur? That's always a question for sociolinguists is, is why does it occur? And this is something that we should always keep in mind if we think about sociolinguistics, because sociolinguistics is about language and it's about people. And people don't do things randomly, typically, especially language change. When you talk about language change, people get very upset. Uh, so how, how can pronouns change? That's a question. How can pronouns change without people getting upset about it? Because when pronoun change happens, people get very upset. Um, so how did this happen? Well, society changed. <laughs> Uh, these social hierarchies and economic class just weren't relevant anymore. Um, people move up and down between social class all the time. You can bankrupt yourself fast. You can become rich. Uh, I don't want to say as fast, but you can move from a lower class to an upper class if you get lucky and work hard. A lot, a lot of factor on luck, but it's not as big of a deal as it used to be. So society changed from being very segmented from, you know, like very separate classes to like now it's now it's the one percent in this giant clump of everyone else so the pronouns don't have a power usage anymore that there's no use for that so it needs some other function if we want to keep the pronouns otherwise we would just have one pronoun there'd be no use for a t and v form so if the t and v forms want to stay it needs a different function and that function happens to be closeness uh, closeness or solidarity. Are there any questions about this stuff? Okay, just a couple more things. So uh, one is a term. So one is a register. It relates back to this hypercorrection that we talked about before and the way people speak. So a register is a variety of language used in a speech situation. So how I like to say a register is just, it's a way we talk in a situation. So we all change the way we speak depending on where we are. If you've worked in customer service, you have a customer service voice. So uh, if you talk to your brother or you talk to siblings or you talk to your parents, you have a different voice. Uh, you probably whine to your parents in ways that you would never whine to anyone else. And you probably don't want other people to hear it. So register is a way that you talk in a certain situation. So this could be a formal way that you talk versus an informal way or a polite way that you talk versus an impolite way um, or just even a natural way that you talk. So when I talk and I lecture, I use different words and different sentence structures and I talk much slower than I do in regular speech. Um, if I'm gonna talk normally, then I'm probably gonna talk a little bit more like this. I'm probably gonna talk a little bit faster and I'm probably gonna start my words and I'm probably gonna you know, talk like this. But if I talk like that when I lecture, people aren't really going to understand. But this is how I normally talk. This is how I normally talk in real life. But I would never talk like this. But it's how I talk. So I use a different register when I lecture. So we can see the different registers for informal text messages and formal dinners. And we'll see a little bit about this next week as well. Uh, one last thing, just because just it's 519, her body art. This isn't really language, but, but this does talk a little bit about how 
uh, communication was done in prison. So uh, in World War II and, and afterwards in Russia, um, tattoos used to signal crimes that people did. So that way in the prison system and outside of prison, you could tell what crimes people committed based on the tattoos that they got on their body. So this isn't something that people do anymore, but this used to be a way that you could tell how bad or dangerous a person was. And even though um, this doesn't happen anymore, there still are some cultures out there that are not too accepting of tattoos just because of the history of them. So um, although we focus mostly on language, uh, there are some expressions that are not necessarily linguistic that are just interesting to look at. Yes, this is why tattoos are not wanted at some establishments because of his history. So like in uh, Japan at many onsens, you can't go in if you have tattoos um, because, well, that's associated with the Yakuza or whatever, the, the criminals there. But um, outside of Japan, there are places who also don't like public tattoos. Um, it's mostly crime related. But anyways, uh, that's it for this week. If you have any questions, you're free to stick around. Other than that, um, I will see you next week. Feel free to email me if you have any other concerns, but expect uh, everything to be marked and up by like the end of the weekend. I'm a little bit busier this week than other weeks. Um, and if you're getting your shot or whatever soon, your second dose, if you're in BC, I think it's about that time. If you have anything that affects you, and you need extensions on things, just let me know. I'm very sympathetic towards it because I know the second shot just like knocks you out. So just let me know. Um, but yeah, see y'all next week. <laughs>